coming up, Hysteresis Sucks Part 2, still sucking, even if you can use it, you know, hypothetically, to cheat a casino. We'll get to that. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Australian new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. Uh, yesterday, Hysteresis Part 1, the bouncy ball, the rolling tyre, it's costing us all thousands and very difficult to subvert. I'll put a link up there to that report. Now, if this were biology and Hysteresis were in that, and I'm sure it is, Hysteresis would be represented by the giant sloth, you know? Here's a hint, it's derived from the ancient Greek word meaning deficiency. But it's even worse than that. In fact, it is a measure of dependency. Specifically, hysteresis is really when the current state of a system is highly dependent on the past. Like how much right now depends on history. It's like letting the past dictate now and also the immediate future. And it affects everything. High-speed stalls in aircraft are harder to recover from thanks to hysteresis. It also impacts literally every breath you take, every cell that splits in two over the course of your entire life. That critical division every time is subject to hysteresis. Automotive systems like climate control, air conditioning and cruise control are hardly exempt. They suffer Terribly. Even games like blackjack are susceptible to hysteresis because the state of the cards in the deck right now absolutely depends upon the cards that have already been dealt historically. And if you're mathematically adept, then hey, you can use this fact to hack the game and predict likely future outcomes. Hysteresis is the basis of all card counting schemes. And if you're good at that, then that's a great way to get chucked out of a casino and strong-armed in the process. Even though most casinos these days have implemented effective countermeasures against card counting schemes. Okay, so it's pretty clear that hysteresis in rubber goes Dr. Kevorkian on the universe. But what does that have to do with cruise control exactly? Because it's not entirely straightforward. Here's a question from John Bywater on his experience with Subaru Cruise Control and in particular how accurate the new Forester's Cruise Control actually is. Of particular interest is how well the cruise control maintains its speed. I have a 2016 3.6R Outback and it's very poor in my view. At 100 k's an hour the variation can be plus or minus 6 k's an hour on gently rolling hills. It even changes by a few kilometres per hour on what appears to be fairly even ground. I've talked to the service staff at two Subaru dealerships and they say it's the CVT. But I wonder if the hysteresis of the cruise control has been dumbed down so as to mask the thirst of the relatively old engine technology. I've driven a Sorento diesel and noticed that it is only variable by one kilometer per hour at the most and that was up a reasonable hill. So your basic thermostat is a great example here and it is just like cruise control and a bouncy ball and tires but especially cruise control in the sense that you set a target, a target temperature in the case of a thermostat and the system's job is to maintain that target. So with a room or a car you might set say 21 degrees C which is 70 F, the ideal room temperature and what your average control system does is maybe kick in the cooling system when the temperature rises to 22 and maybe shut down the cooling system when the temperature drops to 20. Or if it's a heating system, obviously vice versa. Philosophically, cruise control is exactly the same because what you do is you choose a selected travel speed, let's say 100 k's an hour, and then the system responds to changes in the conditions. Like if you go below a predetermined threshold, the engine will power up to get you back up near that 100. And likewise, if you overspeed, the system's going to power back down. So you're going to pass 100 on the way down and pass 100 on the way up and maybe not sit bang on. 
and hey, hopefully you won't notice. Now that's a simplistic way to look at this and obviously these systems get complex fast because different rates of response are programmed in to different rates of change of your travel speed and the complexity increases very quickly once you scratch the surface. Now I'd suggest that there's a big difference between HVAC control systems and cruise control control architecture because HVAC doesn't have to respond rapidly in the time domain you know the solar load and the ambient temperature they might evolve throughout the day but they're not going to increase rapidly in relation to the cabin temperature so when you think about cruise control however there are different external inputs all the time and the A grade way to confuse a cruise control system is just to use it in exactly the wrong set of rolling terrain. Fundamentally, right, cruise control cannot see the road ahead. You can, obviously, but the cruise control cannot. It's kind of locked in this hysteresis adaptation mode based on the past. So when you go over a crest, the car goes from fighting against gravity to copying an assist from gravity. The cruise needs to detect an overspeed event because it's still in hysteresis mode, responding to historically being in an uphill section of road. And then it goes too fast and then it decides to throttle back. That's hysteresis. Likewise, when you go from flat to uphill, an underspeed event needs to occur to trigger the increased throttle input that you need to maintain your speed. So it's always catching up, right? In both cases, the system lags behind the events that you can see either happening now or about to happen in a few seconds because you have the ability to perceive the future in this context and the cruise control does not. And depending on the precise control constraints, like the programmed in response to rates of change and the specifics of the terrain and the effects of that on the speed of the car, you can from time to time hit exactly the wrong combination of rolling terrain, you know, crests and dips and whatever, to totally head fuck your cruise control, which can be very frustrating for the right, or is that wrong kind of absolutely OCD driver. Just to detain you briefly with John's earlier allegation that the Sorrento he drove had allegedly a better cruise control system than the Forester. I'd suggest on the balance of probabilities that this is just a petrol versus diesel thing because I don't think there's anything especially magical about cruise control in Sorrento. Sorrento, Forester, cruise control, both okay. See, with a diesel engine, they've just got more torque available at any given set of normal driving revs compared with the equivalent petrol engine. And what that means is to adapt to a rapidly evolving sort of external input, like let's say you're driving along and suddenly you're in cruise mode and you get to a steep hill. What a petrol engine has to do is it has to do two things. It's got to throttle up and also rev up to deliver the power required to get the job done. What a diesel engine generally has to do in a similar situation is just throttle up and yes I know diesels don't really have throttles we're just talking about delivering more fuel with a diesel but it's a similar sort of thing from a power output point of view so anyway what we're really talking about here is far more adaptation required by the petrol and what's going to happen with the Forester in that situation is the CVT will have to adapt its gearing so that the engine can adopt a higher set of revs to deliver the power to solve the problem whereas all the diesel has to do is deliver a bit more fuel and maintain the revs and hey the job is done so there's a big difference between the engines not so much between the crews. More on the BMW X4 xDrive 30i M Sport. Bit of a mouthful over the next few weeks, but I like it. It's a pretty nice SUV and 350 newton meters from 1450 to 4800 from two liters. I love modern tech and anything with an M Sport badge rocks, generally. I'm not sponsored by BMW, but I doubt I'd object if they placed their hand on my knee over dinner. I've always had poor impulse control like that. Interestingly though, 
Not everyone shares John Bywater's earlier take on Subaru's cruise control accuracy. I've always found it unremarkable, meaning pretty good like most other cruisers, and apparently I am not alone. I have had three Subarus, the last two fitted with adaptive cruise control, and have been consistently amazed at how accurate the cruise control is up and downhill. It uses full range of CVT too, without breaking downhill. So there you go, hysteresis for beer garden engineers, of which you are now one if you have stuck through with me to this point. Hysteresis is everywhere, but we don't all feel it acutely. For those of you who do, who've taken the red pill, hysteresis messes with your balls and sucks you dry. And not in a good way. And yeah, I know it's also fundamental to making ferromagnetic memory work, like in computer hard drives, and also some biological processes depend on it. But mostly, you know, it sucks. On balance, it's a bastard to deal with. Plus, it's part of a design defect that will ultimately kill the universe. It costs you money every day and it makes just about everything harder to design. But aside from that, it's awesome. And if you are OCD enough, hysteresis is gonna make you detest those small cruise control speed variations from here on in. And those cabin temperature fluctuations as well, now that I have made you aware of those. And hey, you're most welcome.